Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another International Dermatology Education Foundation webinar. My name is Roxanne Chabot from RBC Consultants. This evening, we're going to be talking about antibiotic resistance and targeted antibiotic treatment in dermatology. Our host is Dr. Leon Kursik, who is the president of the International Dermatology Education Foundation and clinical professor of dermatology at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis, and medical director of physician skin care, derm research, and skin sciences in Louisville, Kentucky. As our speaker this evening, we have Dr. Christopher Bunick, who is associate professor of dermatology, program and translational biomedicine at Yale University School of Medicine in New Haven, Connecticut. We'd like to thank our supporter, Almeral, for making this educational event possible. Presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues, or if you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit your questions in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser and will be emailed to you one to two days after the webinar. We greatly appreciate it if you could fill in the survey and send it back to us. Finally, within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. Again, please submit your questions using the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. And I wrote, to, or I typed in a little note there so you saw where you have to type them in. So without further ado, I will pass the floor virtually to Dr. Kursik. Roxanne, and good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight to another WebEx series of International Dermatology Education Foundation. As you may know, International Dermatology Education Foundation is a nonprofit organization committed to, um, com committed to improve dermatology care as well as medical education in dermatology all over the world. Tonight, we are very lucky to have Dr. Christopher Bunick, who is an associate professor of dermatology and he's gonna tell us all about antibiotic resistance, targeted antibiotic treatment in dermatology. Thank you, Chris, welcome. Please take it over. Thank you, Leon. It's a pleasure to be here. So I just wanted to start with some disclosures. Uh, the most relevant to today being that I've served as an investigator, speaker, and consultant uh, for Almeral. So we're going to start with a polling question. So what class of antibiotics are most prescribed by dermatologists? So if everyone could select what they think the correct answer is. You have cephalosporins, aminopenicillins, tetracyclines, macrolides, or quinolones. All right, so 85% thought tetracyclines, and second place was cephalosporins. All right. There we go. So it turns out that the most prescribed antibiotics in dermatology are in fact tetracycline class antibiotics. And about 70% of all of our prescriptions are for tetracyclines. And second place, rightfully uh, also seen in that poll or reflected in the poll are cephalosporins. But tetracyclines are most frequently prescribed oral antibiotics for acne especially. Uh, and they're actually the only class of antibiotics that are FDA, uh, FDA approved for acne treatment. And we use tetracyclines in part because they have both antibacterial and anti-inflammatory effects. So let's take a closer look at this prescription habits of dermatologists. So the overall numbers of prescriptions of antibiotics that dermatologists are writing is somewhere around eight or nine million per year in the United States based on 2010 data. 
and, and the types of the oral antibiotics being prescribed, well, we said about 70 or 75 percent are, are tetracyclines, and two thirds of those are actually either doxycycline or minocycline based on 2011 data. So it turns out dermatologists have the highest antibiotic prescription rate per clinician than any physician group. The diseases that we're using these antibiotics for include chronic inflammatory skin diseases like acne vulgaris and acne rosacea. And, and appropriately so, because the American Academy of Dermatology actually does recommend oral antibiotics as a first-line treatment in moderate and severe acne. So in this diagram here, in the, the middle and on the right, we see moderate and severe acne. And if you look at first line and alternative treatments, the red words, oral antibiotics, are there because they are recommended for moderate and severe acne. But it turns out that there are other guidelines that also recommend tetracycline antibiotics for dermatologic diseases other than acne. So here on the left, I highlight four of them, hydradenitis suppurativa, bullous pimpagoid, mucous membrane pimpagoid, and ocular rosacea. So in dermatology, we actually are using tetracyclines for a lot of different things. And that is one reason why the prescription rate is so high. Now there's one myth that I want to address right up front, and that is that, anti that antibiotics that are bactericidal must be better than those that are bacteriostatic because that's not true. So bactericidal agents are defined as those that can kill the bacteria. And examples include benzoyl peroxide, quinolones, vancomycin, metronidazole. Bacteriostatic agents are those that can stop the growth of bacteria, but not necessarily kill them. And examples of those include tetracycline class antibiotics, dapsone, clindamycin, erythromycin. But there's other drug characteristics such as dosing, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, tissue penetration, that affect clinical efficacy uh, that's maybe a little bit different than what you see by, for bacterial killing in in vitro studies. So down at the bottom, I highlight a systematic literature review that was looking at this so-called myth of static versus cytal antibiotics. And what they found was that out of 56 trials that were published since 1985, 49 found no significant difference between bacteriostatic and bactericidal agents. And in fact, six trials found that the bacteriostatic agent was superior to the bactericidal one. Okay. So one myth busted so far. It is my belief that if dermatologists are prescribing tetracyclines at such a high rate, and that they make up roughly 70% of all our antibiotic prescriptions, it's very important that we understand how they're working. So let's take a closer look at the mechanism of action of tetracycline antibiotics. So tetracycline antibiotics actually are all based on a four ring core. So that's what's pictured here in the upper right. You have A, B, C, D rings that are fused together. This is the naphthacine core, or hence the word tetra in tetracyclines. And what I've done is the carbon atom positions here are all numbered, one through 12 around this naphthacine core. And I've colored them two different colors. One is blue for the hydrophilic surface. And this is the surface of this core that is hydrogen bonding with the phosphate oxygen atoms of the 16S ribosomal RNA, the bacterial ribosome. The orange carbon atom positions are the hydrophobic surface. And these are the areas where you can modify the backbone to create different tetracycline drugs without losing inhibitory activity. So let's probe a little deeper into the mechanism of action. Tetracyclines bind to the 30S subunit of the bacterial ribosome, pictured here on the left, is a crystal structure of the 70S bacterial ribosome. And at the top is the 50S subunit, and at the bottom is the 30S subunit. And we can see messenger RNA and PTR, tRNA inside the ribosome. On the right-hand side is a coronal section through the ribosome structure. Again, at the top, we have the 50S subunit, and at the bottom, the 30S subunit. 
So let's take a closer look at the inner workings of the ribosome. And remember, the ribosome is where proteins are made, protein translation. So the decoding center, shown here in yellow, is the primary site where tetracyclines bind. And this decoding center is very important because the acyte tRNA comes in and reads, shown here in orange, the messenger RNA, right? We, hear, we know about codons in messenger RNA. The a, this tRNA, the acyte tRNA, is coming in and reading the codon on the messenger RNA, no, which tells it which amino acid to bring to the growing polypeptide chain or protein that's at the peptidyl transferase center, shown here in purple. And then the growing protein exits out the exit tunnel of the ribosome. And then as sequential amino acids are brought in, the tRNAs move from the A site to the P site and then through the exit site. So I always believe a picture is worth a thousand words. So I invite you into the movie theater and let's actually look at protein translation in action. So what we're looking at here, the yellow stringy thing is the messenger RNA and we're now looking inside the ribosome at the A site, P site, so here's the beginning again. So you have your messenger RNA bound by the 30S ribosome. The big purple thing is the 50S ribosome. Now we're gonna look inside and you're gonna see the A site, P site, TR, TR, exit site tRNAs coming in. And then at the top, the growing red strand is the polypeptide or growing protein. So we'll go through it one more time here. You're seeing the ribosome on the messenger RNA. We're now, we're, we're zooming in into the, 30S subunit looking at the tRNA cycle and the growing polypeptide chain at the top. Okay, so now that we have a background of how tetracyclines are working by inhibiting protein translation that's, that the ribosome is doing in these bacteria, I want to bring your attention to an advance in the tetracycline class, and that is a targeted narrow spectrum antibiotic. This slide highlights the evolution of tetracycline class antibiotics. On the far left, we have the first generation tetracycline, which was FDA approved in 1953. In the center, we have second generation uh, doxycycline and minocycline approved in 1967 and 1971, respectively. Together, the first generation and second generation tetracyclines are broad spectrum. And we'll define that in just a minute. On the far right, we have sericycline, the newest agent to the tetracycline class. This was FDA approved for the treatment of acne vulgaris in 2010. If we look at the chemical structure of sericycline, what we see is that it has the longest and largest moiety attached to the C7 position of this four ring core of any of the tetracycline antibiotics. <coughs> Excuse me. This gives sericycline unique properties that we're going to discuss going forward. It also gives sericycline this unique property of being narrow spectrum, and, and we're going to define that more in a couple slides. So my research laboratory, in collaboration with Dr. Yuri Polikinov at the University of Illinois Chicago, determined the crystal structure of sericycline bound to the bacterial ribosome. And this was published in 2020 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. If we look at the image on the left, we see in yellow sericycline. And at the top, we see these red circles or balls. Those are the hydrophilic oxygen atoms that are binding to the gray 16S ribosomal RNA. So I talked about the hydrophilic surface of the tetracyclines, and that's what that surface represents. But we see at the bottom of the yellow sericycline structure, this big moiety that's reaching out and it's interacting with the green messenger RNA. That's the C7 moiety that makes sericycline chemically distinct from doxycycline and minocycline. And what we observed in the structure with this is that the C7 moiety, actually hydrogen bonds interacts with the messenger RNA, which none of the other tetracycline derivatives have ever been shown to do. So there's a unique mechanism of action of sericycline that has been scientifically uncovered. So let's define a little bit more what we mean by spectrum of antibiotic activity. Here on the left are, are the broad spectrum antibiotics, and we use them 
because they're active against a wide range of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria throughout the body. And we often like to use them for empirical treatment when you do not know what the causative pathogen is. <clears throat> so examples of broad-spectrum antibiotics include tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline, azithromycin, ampicillin, moxicillin, and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazine. Now, narrow-spectrum antibiotics differ because they target a few types of bacteria in specific locations in the body. And we typically want to use them when the causative pathogen is known. So examples include sericycline, having a proclivity to target gram-positive bacteria, and vancomycin, as well as some others. Now, why is this important? Well, we know that broad-spectrum antibiotics tend to be harsh on the gastrointestinal system, and particularly the microbiome of the gut. 80 million, uh, eight, excuse me, 80 trillion out of the 100 trillion microbes in the human body live in the gut. And we know that broad-spectrum antibiotics can deplete gut bacterial diversity and select for intrinsically resistant bacteria. And together, this creates gut dysbiosis which we're learning more and more has significant health consequences. So here's a new polling question. Broad spectrum antibiotics can alter the gut microbiota or the organisms living in the gut for how long post therapy? Three months, six months, a year, two years, or five years? What does the audience think? So six months was the winner with two years being second place, about a quarter of everybody in the audience. So the, the answer I was looking for was two years. So let's take a look at some of the science, why? So broad spectrum antibiotics can actually alter the number and the types of intestinal bacteria both during and after antibiotic treatment. And newer data shows that even a short term seven day use of antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics can alter the gut microbiota for up to two years post treatment. That's a pretty powerful uh, fact for, for all clinicians, not just dermatologists. So if we look closer at this figure, we see on the y-axis bacterial cell number and on the x-axis time. At the very beginning, we see a nice diversity of the number and types of bacteria. And when you do antibiotic treatment or start antibiotic treatment and then end antibiotic treatment, the period of time within the, the vertical red dashed lines, we see a decrease in the number and types of bacteria in the intestine. And then after treatment, we see that it takes a significant amount of time for the intestines to recover the bacterial diversity and numbers that it had prior to the antibiotics. This is an important thing for all dermatologists to understand because it impacts the concept of antibiotic stewardship that we'll come to later in the talk. So what are some real world consequences of gut microbiome perturbation? Well, here on the left, there's evidence that antibiotic-driven gut microbiome perturbation can actually alter immunity to vaccines, in particular, in this case, the influenza vaccine. On the upper right, gut dysbiosis has been linked to hypertension. And then in the bottom right, it's also been linked to Alzheimer's disease through a microbiota gut-brain axis. So let's get into some of the science about this new innovation in the tetracycline class, sericycline. So what we're looking at here is the minimal inhibitory activity of tetracycline antibiotics against gram-positive bacteria on the left and gram-negative bacteria on the right. So as a reminder, the higher the minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC, the lower the antimicrobial activity. So let's start here on the left the gram-positive bacteria. 
So the MIC is the y-axis and the different species of, of uh, bacteria, the x-axis. So sericycline is in blue, tetracycline in purple, doxycycline in, in magenta, and minocycline in gray. And what we see for the gram-positive QD bacterium acnes and Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis, that all these tetracyclines are pretty active, pretty good against these organisms. But if we go over to the right and look at gram-negative bacteria, whether it's uh, Enterobacter or Escherichia coli species, K. pneumoniae, what we see is that blue, which is sericycline, is very high. So the MIC of sericycline is very high against these intestinal gram-negative bacteria, meaning it doesn't work as well. And But we see that tetracycline, doxycycline, and minocycline are a little bit stronger against these gram-negative bacteria. So ultimately what this means is that sericycline as a narrow spectrum agent targets the gram positives that we want it to target, particularly C. acnes, but it doesn't target as much the gram-negative bacteria in the gut. And there's been a couple publications that have come out just recently that everyone should be aware of. First, there is a, a publication in MDPI Antibiotics showing that sericycline directly compared to minocycline was targeted 79% less of the gut microbiota. I, think about that, that's a lot. And then there was a paper just in the last week out of the United Kingdom where they looked at a colonic model for, uh, for the microbiome of the colon uh, and found that sericycline compared to doxycycline and minocycline substantially had lower alteration of the colonic microbiome compared to the broad spectrum tetracyclines. So I think that this, the idea of broad versus narrow spectrum is gaining scientific momentum in the tetracycline space. So why are we using sericycline against C. acnes, right? We show, I showed that, that sericycline and the other tetracyclines are very good against gram-positive C. acnes. And that's because QD bacterium acnes is an anaerobic gram-positive organism uh, that's a normal component of the skin flora and thought to be one of the four main pathogenic factors driving acne lesion formation, along with follicular hyperkeratinization, increased sebum production, and inflammation. And it actually turns out that immune responses to C. acnes uh, contribute to the development of inflammatory lesions. I mentioned on the first slide that one of the main reasons dermatologists use tetracycline antibiotics besides their antibacterial activity is because we always believe or say that they have anti-inflammatory activity as well. So in this slide, this is a figure that I created for a paper that we just published in, in antibiotics as well, uh, highlighting, summarizing all of the anti-inflammatory properties of, of tetracycline antibiotics. So we're going to start here at the top, 12 o'clock. So tetracyclines can suppress pro-inflammatory cytokine release. So they can suppress TNF-alpha, interleukin-1-beta, IL-6, and IL-8, which is a neutrophil recruiter. Tetracyclines can inhibit lipases, inhibit neutrophil migration. Together, this reduces tissue destruction. They can inhibit caspases, which can lead to anti-apoptotic effects. They can scavenge reactive oxygen species at a level similar to vitamin E, and also inhibit nitric oxide synthase expression. And this leads to reduction in oxidative stress and damage. They can also inhibit matrix metalloproteinases, collagenases, gelatinases, stromalysins, and this protects the extracellular matrix from digestion. And this little diagram here is just to say that it's thought that they inhibit matrix metalloproteinases through divalent cation coordination of calcium and zinc. And lastly, Tetracyclines can reduce cellular activation, and this has been shown through reduction of mast cell activation, inhibition of T lymphocyte activation and proliferation, and inhibition of angiogenesis in mouse models and inhibition of granuloma formation in in vitro studies. So what about some in vivo data regarding sericycline, doxycycline, and minocycline? Well, that's what we show here in 
that is the anti-inflammatory effects of the tetracyclines in a rat foot pad edema model. So this table is highlighting the inflammation or the reduction of inflammation uh, from these antibiotics in this particular model. And what's observed is that doxycycline, minocycline, and sericycline all had comparable reduction or anti-inflammatory effect in this model, reducing the mean percent inflammation compared to the untreated controls roughly on the order of 30 to 45 percent. So what does this mean for the prescriber that, or the dermatologist actively prescribing tetracyclines for active vulgaris? So this table here kind of compares and highlights some of the side effects that the tetracycline class antibiotics have and differentiates it between the broad and narrow spectrum activity. <coughs> Excuse me. So on the, on the far right, if we start on the far right and look at spectrum of activity, tetracycline, doxycycline, and minocycline are all broad spectrum, as we said, and sericycline is the narrow spectrum. If we move one cat column to the left, let's look at the vestibular adverse events. They tend to be highest for minocycline, and we're going to talk about why, but sericycline has very low vestibular adverse events. If we move one column more to the left, we've already talked about how ne sericycline is narrow spectrum and has less GI uh, disturbance of the gut microbiome, and this correlates with less GI upset whereas doxycycline tends to have the highest GI upset. Photosensitivity-wise, sericycline has very low to no photosensitivity. So let's take a little bit closer look at some of the science behind this. So sericycline actually has reduced blood-brain barrier penetration compared to minocycline. So this is a, a, a study that uh, was performed in rats using IV sericycline or IV minocycline at one mg per kg. And then the brain and the whole blood samples were harvested at one, three, and six hours following dosing. So if we look on the left, what we see in the plasma is that when the drug concentrations are analyzed by mass spectrometry, that in sericycline in blue and the minocycline in teal, that in the plasma, both medications can be observed in these rats at one, three, and then less so, but still present at six hours. If we look at the brain of the rats, the minocycline in teal is detectable at all time frames, one, three, and six hours. But the sericycline is not detectable. It's not even at the level of detection by the mass spectrometry. So sericycline does not penetrate the blood-brain barrier at the same level of minocycline. So one of the reasons we think this is so is because it has a lower lipophilicity. It, shown here in the orange table are distribution coefficients. The numbers are not important, but what's important is these two solvent systems, octanol water and chloroform water, were used to measure distribution coefficients. Uh, and what was observed was that sericycline has lower lipophilicity at pH 5.5 and 7.4 than minocycline. And what that means is lower lipophilicity leads to a lower penetration of the blood-brain barrier. And therefore, therefore, sericycline may have lower vestibular side effects compared to minocycline, explaining what's seen in patients uh, with regard to the vestibular side effects. And from a structural point of view, what I highlight here is that this unique C7 moiety that sericycline has, has an oxygen atom. And oxygen atoms can function as an acceptor of hydrogen bonds, which is exactly shown here uh, with the messenger RNA. And this uh, oxygen and accepting of hydrogen bonds can reduce the lipophilicity. <coughs> so that brings us to the drug resistance aspect of oral antibiotics. So why is antibiotic resistance problematic? When bacteria develop resistance, antibiotics tend to no longer work to treat the infection or an infection. Bacterial resistance genes can spread to nearby bacteria, even to different types of bacteria. And antibiotic resistance tends to be more common when antibiotics are used for prolonged durations, or if they're started and then stopped in a repetitive fashion, or if broad spectrum antibiotics are used. <coughs> 
if we look at some recent data, in the top, I highlight data from the United States. Now, this data is from 1983, and surprisingly, there's not more recent data that I can find in the literature. But back in 1983, if you took C. acne's isolates from patients, 57% were resistant to doxycycline. Now, clindamycin and erythromycin, it was even worse, even more resistance, but 57% to doxycycline. In red in the middle is more recent data out of the country Jordan in 2020. Now, what they found were that C. acne's isolates, about 37% were resistant to doxycycline, 36% resistant to tetracycline, only 3% were resistant to minocycline, which actually is a little bit surprising to me, but that's the data they have. At the very bottom is 2020 data as well out of Israel. And what they found were that C. acne's isolates, about 19% were resistant to doxycycline, 8% to tetracycline, and 11% to minocycline. And you can also see erythromycin was 25% and clindamycin 16%. So antibiotic resistance in C. acne's is a real phenomenon. And antibiotic resistance across the entire globe is important. So there was an important paper published in, in this year in Lancet that looked at antimicrobial resistance across the year 2019 globally. And what they found was there was approximately 4.9 million deaths associated with antimicrobial resistance. So this concept of antimicrobial resistance is real and it's real based on the data just a few years ago in 2019 globally. Now, some people uh, that are listening might say, well, antibiotic resistance isn't a problem because I use sub-antimicrobial dosing. There's this pervading uh, concept in, in dermatology that the use of sub-antimicrobial dosing somehow subverts the pressure for antibiotic resistance. That may not be the case. There's a growing amount of scientific evidence that you can select resistant bacteria even at very low antibiotic concentrations, that there can be microbiological effects of sublethal levels of antibiotics. How about this one in the upper right? Evolution of high level resistance during low level antibiotic exposure. So the point that I'm trying to make is that a lot of times dermatologists fall back on sub-antimicrobial dosing, whether it's acne vulgaris or acne rosacea, but emerging science is saying that's not actually good enough to reduce antibiotic resistance. Over here on the right, I highlight some main mechanisms by which uh, antibiotic resistance occurs. It can be due to limited uptake of the drug or decreased cell permeability. It can be due to actively exporting a drug. Uh, so here shown number one, that the efflux pump can pump drugs out of the bacteria. You can modify a drug target so this is what ribosomal protection proteins do, or you can inactivate the drug through some other means. Now, we talked about sericycline, this innovation in the antibiotic space, and sericycline with this long C7 moiety was actually engineered to help overcome some of these resistance mechanisms, particularly the efflux pump and the ribosomal protection proteins. What I want to do is show some of the science about how this narrow spectrum antibiotic can overcome bacterial resistance. So now I'm going back to the crystal structure that my laboratory determined uh, and published in PNAS. Shown here in green is the TET-M ribosomal protection protein. And what we found in our structure is that when we model TET-M, that the C7 moiety of sericycline actually has a steric clash with loop three domain four, particularly residues proline 509 and valine 510. So the analogy I like to use is that this C7 moiety is like the stiff arm of a running back in football, keeping that defender, which is Tet M, away so it can't be tackled. If we look now, so here's sericycline that we we're just looking at. If we look now at tetracycline, it has no C7 moiety and, and no C9 moiety for that matter. And we can see that TET-M has unfettered access to that ring D to pop tetracycline out of its binding site. 
On the lower right is tigacycline. We don't use that in dermatology uh, pretty much at all, but tigacycline has a C7 moiety, not as long or as large as serocycline, but uh, also a longer C9 moiety, and in it creates significant steric clash that prevents TET-M from coming in and dislodging the antibiotic. So modifications to ring D can significantly reduce TET-M ability to, to promote antibiotic resistance and serocycline C7 moiety does just that. So what I'd like to do now is actually walk you through a movie. So a picture is worth a thousand words. So we're gonna look at mechanisms of action of evading resistance and how serocycline works on the ribosome. So part one is looking at the mechanism of resistance against tetracycline in general. So what we're looking at here is the wild type 70S ribosome in complex with tetracycline. Tetracycline shown in red, bound in the decoding center. The messenger RNA is in magenta, and the ptRNA in blue. So here is the model TET-M ribosomal protection protein coming into the ribosome. And we're gonna zoom in on that. So tetracycline is still bound in that decoding center, and we see that TET-M, this ribosomal protection protein, can come in and dislodge tetracycline from the binding site in the decoding center. So this is antibiotic resistance by movie. So now we're gonna look at the binding site of serocycline on the 70S ribosome. So this is the, again, the wild type 70S ribosome, now in complex with serocycline. So serocycline's in yellow, also bound in the decoding center, similar to other tetracyclines. The messenger RNA is in magenta, the P-site tRNA in blue. We're gonna zoom in. So in gray at the top is that 16S ribosomal RNA. This is the part of the ribosome where that hydrophilic surface of serocycline and other tetracyclines binds. And then if we look at the bottom, we see the C7 moiety of serocycline and we see it hydrogen bonded to the magenta messenger RNA. This is that unique contact that only serocycline has among the tetracyclines. This gives it additional stability. This additional interaction with the messenger RNA helps stabilize serocycline into the binding site and makes it harder to dislodge by resistance mechanisms like TET-M. So now what we're looking at is how serocycline prevents protein translation. So the acyte tRNA cannot get access to read the messenger RNA when serocycline is dumbing up or blocking the decoding center. So without an antibiotic, the acyte tRNA can come in and read the messenger RNA codon. But now with serocycline in yellow in place, it can prevent that. And again, that stiff arm, that C7 moiety, it keeps the, not just the A site tRNA away, it keeps the TET-M away, which I believe is what the last part of the movie shows. So this is how serocycline, as a narrow spectrum tetracycline, can evade antibiotic resistance. So now we're zooming in on the, the decoding center. Here's the, here's the model TET-M first in green coming into the 70S ribosome. And now we zoom in, and what we see that TET-M has less ability to displace serocycline because that C7 moiety is blocking it, and because serocycline has that extra interaction with messenger RNA, holding it in tighter to the binding site. So like all movies, got to roll the credits. Okay, so what I just showed you was science behind why this narrow spectrum serocycline, this advance in the tetracycline class, actually also has very low rates of development of antibiotic resistance. And actually, this led to the, the FDA approving a label change for serocycline, specifically stating 
that C. acne strains display a very low propensity for developing antibiotic resistance to sericycline, approximately one in 10 billion. It is the only oral antibiotic that's FDA approved for acne that currently has such a low resistance claim on its label. This leads us to antibiotic stewardship. In dermatology, I believe that we can do better. The CDC has called for the use of narrow spectrum antibiotics whenever possible. It believes, the CDC, that the core principles of antibiotic stewardship should include selecting narrow spectrum agents when feasible. And the American Academy of Dermatology has stressed antibiotic stewardship, particularly asking us to use the right dose of the right antibiotic at the right time for the right duration. A consensus statement on ne treating neonatal through preadolescent acne stated here in the upper or here in the right side, narrow antibacterial spectrum antibiotics may have advantages over broad spectrum antibiotics, specifically citing sericycline for these uh, neonatal through preadolescent acne patients. Now, this is an interesting slide because you I doubt that many people have actually taken the time to look at the package label of doxycycline or minocycline. So while we're emphasizing the advances in narrow spectrum tetracyclines, it's important to understand that broad spectrum antibiotics do have a very important place in medicine, and that's for treating infectious diseases. And that's what these labels, package labels of doxycycline and minocycline show. Here are the indications in usage for doxycycline and minocycline. I don't expect you to be able to read them all, but what I'm going to tell you, every single indication on both of these panels is an infectious disease, except for one small statement. Adjunctive therapy in severe acne, and then down at the bottom right for minocycline. In severe acne, minocycline may be used as adjunctive therapy. So all of these other indications are infectious diseases. And so we as dermatologists have a duty to protect these broad spectrum antibiotics for the infectious diseases that they're really good at treating. So I believe that there's a new treatment paradigm for the use of oral antibiotics in dermatologic disease. In the past, we've only had broad spectrum antibiotics that target all these different organisms. But now we have narrow spectrum antibiotics and it's up to industry to innovate further and bring us even more narrow spectrum antibiotics because they can enhance antibiotic stewardship, they can protect the host microbiome, they can reduce antibiotic resistance. And it's been shown to be effective both on the face and trunk for moderate to severe inflammatory acne. So I wanted to end with some antibiotic stewardship and clinical action. This is recently published data last week at the journal MDPI Antibiotics. So you can read the article uh, if you will. So the premise is this, and this is my premise, sericycline can replace doxycycline and minocycline as the first line narrow spectrum antibiotic treatment in order to reduce antibiotic resistance, maintain human microbiome homeostasis, and decrease risks of adverse events. And I wanna show a series of five patients. So here's antibiotic stewardship and clinical action patient one. This is a 67 year old Caucasian male that has a history of atopic dermatitis, was on dupilumab 300 milligrams every week. At day zero, we see at the top A and B, these red crusted lesions. And the aerobic culture was positive for heavy growth of Staph aureus. On day 11, after nine days of oral sericycline, 100 milligrams daily, there was a significant improvement in these Staph aureus infected sores on this guy's head. Patient two, this is a 36 year old Caucasian male. He had a history of atopic dermatitis associated with marked dyshidrosis of the feet, more so than the hands, with an IgE elevation at 465. So we see here in panel A, 
the way his feet looked with the red crusted lesions and the aerobic culture was positive for heavy growth of Staph aureus. So I, I thought that this was impetigenized, uh, atopic dermatitis, dyshydrotic subtype. And after, on day nine, after nine days of oral serocycle and 100 milligrams daily, there was significant reduction in the Staph aureus infection and the inflammation on this gentleman's foot. So in patient three, this is a 52-year-old Caucasian male with history of atopic dermatitis associated with IgE elevation above 2700. In panel A on the left, we can see significant redness across the upper extremities bilaterally, as well as somewhat across the chest. And it's a little bit hard to make out here, but you, th these lesions were oozing and crusting, particularly on the forearms. And at day zero, he had an aerobic culture that showed moderate growth of met methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus. On day nine, after nine days of oral serocycle on 100 milligrams daily, he had a remarkable clearance of erythema, oozing, and crusting. So these first three patients are really targeting Staphylococcus aureus, which we know from studies that have been published, we know that serocycline is very good at targeting staphylococcal species, particularly staph aureus. And so clinically, this is showing that all the times we use tetracyclines to treat staphylococcal infections, that serocycline is an effective narospectrum agent that adheres to antibiotic stewardship. But we also talk about, we also use in dermatology uh, tetracyclines for their anti-inflammatory effects. This was an 83-year-old woman who presented with three weeks of a very painful lesion on the left upper eyelid that did not improve with warm compresses. And because of the severity of her pain and her age, she was uh, given um, nine days of oral serocycline, 100 milligrams daily, and she was seen back at day 15. And there was approximately 75% reduction of the inflammation of this eyelid sty, which was associated with overall ocular rosacea. So lastly, this is a 78-year-old woman who reported in, after an influenza infection in January 2019 that she developed red, blistering, bleeding, and painful lesions of the, of the gingiva. Uh, and this was consistent with mucous membrane pemphigoid. Uh, she had, did have elevated uh, antibodies after a period of time to BP-180. So at the top, we see day zero, we see some erythema along the, the gingiva, particularly here, along here, and then again up here. So on day 38, after oral serocycline 60 milligrams daily, there was a significant reduction in the erythema of the gingiva. So this was a patient who was having, she was tried on doxycycline, had significant GI upset, needed probiotics. Switching to serocycline, she said that her GI upset disappeared. She no longer required probiotics to tolerate the medication. And the anti-inflammatory effect that we try to achieve with the tetracyclines was experienced with serocycline. So this was a judicious use of antibiotic stewardship. So that, I'd like to, to thank the people, particularly behind the science in my lab, uh, Dr. Von Lemakin, uh, and my collaborators in particular around serocycline, Dr. Yuri Polikinov at the University of Illinois Chicago, and Dr. Ayman Grada uh, from Boston University. Uh, and here's all my funding uh, that I've had for my laboratory throughout the years. And uh, uh, that concludes the talk, and I'll be very happy to, to now move to the discussion phase and answer questions. Thank you. Once again, if you want to ask questions to uh, our faculty, please put your questions in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you think of any questions after the webinar, you can always send them to info at idfeducationalseries.com. Again, we would like to thank our supporter, Almiral, for making this educational event possible. Thank you, Roxanne. <clears throat> Chris, thank you for that so thoughtful, so insightful lecture. I think that would be the, that would be the best antibiotic lecture I have ever seen. 
that was so good. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, does giving probiotics help in any way during the duration of therapy? So I think that there's more and more evidence that uh, the gut, you know, we know that the gut microbiome is so important to human health. And if you had asked me this question 10 years ago, I would say, eh, you're crazy, you're wasting your money on probiotics. But the more I learn about the gut microbiome, the more I realize there are so many factors that can affect the, the healthy lo levels of bacteria that are symbiotic with us in the gut. And, and so I do think that probiotics can play a role for some patients. I was just saying for that last patient uh, uh, that I put on seracycline for mucous membrane pimpagoid, when she was on doxycycline, she needed probiotics and they did help her tolerate the medicine. But in the case of seracycline, she didn't need the probiotics and she had better GI, she had less GI upset. So probiotics in a way were helping try to, to compensate uh, for the, the harm to the gut microbiome. So certainly probiotics do have a, have a, a place uh, for the right patient. Great. The next question is, do you think uh, with seracycline, let me see, hold on. Sorry about that. Is seracycline available in Canada? I know it's not, so I'll answer that. Can we expect less C. difficile and less risk of IBD with seracycline? Well, I have not specifically uh, read studies that directly look at that. However, based on the science about uh, about disruption of or, or the gut dysbiosis, right? Seracycline has less gut dysbiosis compared to the broad spectrum tetracyclines. I think it's natural to make the hypothesis that yes, seracycline is going to uh, reduce risks of, of C. difficile and also reduce risks of uh, any type of irritant or inflammatory bowel disease. So the next two questions, I think it's sort of related. Uh, one is why has antibiotic stewardship been difficult for dermatologists to adopt or adhere into in the past? And the other one, don't you think that the access to seracycline is limited by insurance company coverage? So let me start with the second one. And yes, I mean, right now, access to seracycline is limited by insurance companies. But here's what I think is going to happen. The more science that keeps getting published about the benefits of narrow spectrum antibiotics, and, and, and not just seracycline, but in, in other specialties as well, when we think about this, narrow spectrum antibiotics are part of the larger effort in medicine for precision medicine, right? We talk about precision medicine, the precision care for our patients. And that's what narrow spectrum antibiotics are. And I think insurance companies, as more and more data comes out, what they're going to realize is that they actually save money in the long run by, by allowing patients access to narrow spectrum targeted precision medicines that spare the gut microbiome as well as the skin microbiome. We didn't talk about that. So I think that insurance companies are going to realize that their cost calculation currently is wrong and that, that the microbiome sparing effects of these narrow spectrum antibiotics along with the decreased antibiotic resistance is actually incredibly important. Now, a lot of dermatologists might say, well, I don't see antibiotic resistance in my practice. Why do I need to practice antibiotic stewardship? And I think that's been one of the limiting factors. And, and I'm guilty, five years ago, I said the same thing but I don't believe it anymore. I don't believe it anymore. And the thing is that in dermatology, we treat our acne patients, they go away. They're not necessarily coming back to us saying I'm having GI upset. They're not coming back to us saying, hey, my GI, my gut dysbiosis caused by my antibiotic for acne is now causing me not to react to vaccines, or now I have hypertension, or now it's, you know, all of these, diseases that are associated with gut dysbiosis that we're just still scratching the surface of understanding, uh, I, I think that, that we as dermatologists, we don't see that in our clinic, not because it doesn't exist, because the patients don't come to us for those problems, or these problems haven't been known, or there's not great ways for necessarily measuring them. And, and I think that we in dermatology, as the science evolves, I think are going to come to the conclusion and, and I do believe that dermatologists as a whole uh, will do this because 
think about what's happened in the psoriasis space, the atopic dermatitis space, precision medicines come out and what's happening. The entire fields are evolving to where we're using these precision biologics for our patients because they're better, they're safer. And I think that the same evolution or revolution that's occurring in antibiotic space, it, it mirrors what's happened in the biologic space. And I think dermatologists should think about it that way, that if it's okay for me to take these biologics and use them because they're better precision medicines, well, then maybe the antibiotic, narrow spectrum antibiotics, I should do that too, because in the long run, the health of health benefits, uh, the science is going to support it. Excellent. So the next question is, do you use it also in rosacea? And also, how do you have the conversation? How do you start the conversation with your patient to start the cycling? So with regard to rosacea, uh, yes and no. So there are studies published showing that sericycline is very effective in rosacea. And I, I showed the patient number four today with ocular rosacea associated sty that did very well. So there are other studies published in rosacea that do show it works, not just in rosacea, but also in periorificial dermatitis. That data is published. Um, for me, I would love to use it first line all the time in rosacea. The biggest problem for me is uh, getting it covered by insurance. And we sort of talked about that. Now, could you code it as other acne? And Because technically, right, acne rosacea, acne vulgaris, is it okay to code it as other acne? Uh, I haven't done that in my practice. I don't know if other dermatologists do that. Um, something to think about. So I can tell you a little bit about the rosacea because I did the investigation initiated study with Dr. Drelos and a couple of other of my colleagues. And we did have a really good results, patient responded, which makes sense, right? It's anti-inflammatory. If they're going to respond to doxycycline, they're going to respond certainly to serocycline. Uh, the next question was, how do you start that serocycline conversation with your patient? So this is what I tell my patients. And I believe my success rate is about 100%, meaning that patients, they understand this message. And, and so I tell a patient or a mother of a child, a patient, right, um, or a teenage patient, I say that sericycline is the newest uh, narrow spectrum antibiotic in the tetracycline class. And what that means is that it hurts your gut less, so you have less GI upset, and it has the least antibiotic resistance of any of the oral antibiotics that have been studied to date. So this means that it's safer for you, in addition to the fact that it has very low uh, you know, vestibular side effects, dizzy, low dizziness, as well as low phototoxicity. So what you're getting for your money is a highly effective medication, as effective as any of the other antibiotics, but a lot safer. And patients will spend the money when they know what they're getting. And that's how in my practice, I've been able to use the narrow spectrum more, uh, is that patients will spend the money when they actually know what they're paying for. We are almost getting on time there on the clock, but I have one more question, which is a great question. This comes up quite a bit. What's the maximum amount of time you keep your patients on serocycline? Well, what I can tell you is that there is actually an entire safety trial, an open extension safety trial for one year. So there is safety data for one year on serocycline published in the literature that you can go look at. Uh, and I think that that's a very encouraging safety data. That, that's a long time uh, with uh, one year on serocycline. So I would have no hesitation using one year based on the safety data that's published. Excellent. Thank you so much. We're right at 7.59. So have a good evening, everyone. I thank my, our supporter, Almiral, one more time. And also, if you like this conversation, we're going to have a much more extensive one on June 28th at 6.30 p.m. again with Dr. Bunik, as well as a GI expert, as well as a microbiology expert, as well as an infectious disease expert, as well as Dr. Jim Del Rosso. So we're going to have a really a star crew on June 28th. Please join us on that conversation as well. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Good night.